Good morning to everybody. Uh, good morning also to the people that are connected to this uh, interesting topic. So uh, our, we are very, very happy and uh, we are delighted to have here with us uh, Professor Aldo Badiani. Uh, he is uh, among the pioneering scientists in the field of drug addiction and uh, he worked on the, in this field for decades, I would say, since he's actually one among uh, the most uh, recognized scientists in this field. So Professor Badiani actually at present is uh, the chair of the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology at University of Rome, La Sapienza, and uh, is as well Emeritus Professor of Psychology in the School of Psychology, University of Sussex. Uh, he received uh, several academic positions, and uh, so just to, 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 to <laughs> to remind that uh, he's uh, actually a very, very well-known scientist uh, and pharmacologist in, uh, in the drug addiction. So basically, drug addiction uh, represents a very fascinating topic, uh, and uh, it's not so clear in which extent addiction is directly related to a genetic or radar an environmental uh, vulnerability uh, effect or in which extent genetics and environmental factor can modulate addiction. And uh, in uh, this respect, uh, uh, there is uh, actually probably the most important contribution of, the, of Professor Aldo Badiani in this uh, field of research. And uh, we are really happy to, to have you here. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Alessandro, for inviting me. Thank you to all of you for being here. Um, I'm going to talk about drug reward as a function of contest. Uh, the title is a little bit different from what is in the, the flyer. Uh, I'm talking about drug reward first, and then I'm going to discuss the implication for drug addiction. Often these two issues are mixed. So you, you jump from reward to addiction in a snap of a finger, but things are not so obvious. Okay, I'm going to tell you this, basically a story that spanned almost the entire, my entire scientific career. You can see how old I am when I start with this paper by Roy Wise and Michael Bozart. This paper was published in 1987. This was the first grand unifying theory of drug addiction. The psychomotor stimulant theory of drug addiction stipulated three assumptions. First, all addictive drugs have psychomotor stimulant actions. Second, the stimulant action uh, depend on shared neurobiological substrates. And third, the biological mechanisms responsible for the psychomotor stimulant actions are homologous to those responsible for the rewarding action of drugs. So this is a grand unifying theory because basically say all drugs that can produce addiction have this, share these properties. And this has an incredible implication that are still with us because the basic assumption are still accepted by most people in the field with some, with some slight difference from one school or another. So this is a graphic representation of this model. You can take all additive drugs, doesn't matter what are the primary neuropharmacological action, in the end, the shared substrate is dopaminergic transmission. And dopaminergic transmission in the, the, the theory of, by Roy Wise is responsible for both the psychomotor stimulant action and for reward effects of the drugs. As I said, most, most scientists, most scholars in the field agrees with this assumption. Differences are just in sort of what you can th think of as a secondary detail. For example, what exactly dopamine is doing? Is error prediction signal? It is mediating drug pleasure? It is mediating incentive salience? I'm going to discuss this di different aspect of reward later. So th th there is no agreement on that. But almost everybody agrees that dopamine plays an important central role. And another assumption is that drugs, by acting repeatedly on this circuitry, here I've represented only dopaminergic circuitry, but of course there are projections from the, from the cortex, from other areas, there are 
connection with the uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with amygdala, with the insula, with different subnuclear of these structures. Uh, the, the circuit is very complex, but everything is centered on dopaminergic transmission. The assumption is that by acting on this system, drugs produce <coughs> neuroplastic changes. For some, the, the, the subriquet is a sensitization, and these neuroplastic changes are responsible for the transition to addiction. So people become vulnerable to drug addiction after using drugs repeatedly because of these neuroplastic changes. Uh, actually, let me. So when I arrived at Concordia University in 1990, Ray Weiss had published the, the theory just uh, since a few years. And I was in Jane Stewart lab, one of the grandmothers of modern biopsychology. So it was next door from Roy Weiss lab. And um, Lini Di Chiara and Cagliari just published seminal studies in showing that all addictive drugs can increase dopaminergic, dopamine levels in the striatum. So this was the, 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 the scientific environment I was, I was in. And when I arrived in Jane Stewart lab, I started to do things that had nothing to do with what I'm going to talk today nothing to do with drug addiction, but I was continuously thinking about this kind of model. And right at the end of my postdoc in Jane Stewart Lab, in 19, at the end of 1992, but just by chance, I made an observation. I was injecting rats with three milligram per kilogram amphetamine, for a reason that I'm not going to discuss now, have to do with the anorectic effect of drugs, just forget about that. So three kilo milligram per kilogram amphetamine, and I was noticing that these rats were not moving as much as in experiments I've done in Rome with exactly the same dose of drugs and with the same rats as Pragdoli. Actually, since then we know that they are not the same animals, but regardless, at the, at the time I was thinking, oh, Pragdoli, amphetamine, they should do, the effects should be the same. Bonafide pharmacologist, so thinking drug, receptor, effect. And so the, the difference was so big that I started to think maybe there is something about the, 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 the testing procedure that make a difference. Indeed, the rats that I was uh, working with in, uh, in Montreal, they received the drugs in their home cage, whereas the rats that I was testing in Rome, they received the drugs when they were out of the home environment. So I started to think maybe the, this, the relative novelty of the environment can have an effect on uh, the response to drugs. And then I moved to work with uh, Terry Robinson at the University of Michigan, and also Terry was interested in the, in, in the role of environment in modulating drug effect from another angle, especially conditioning. And we set up a series of experiments in which we tested rats under two different settings. Can you see any difference here? These two, do they look different? This is not a quiz. Spot the difference. There is no difference. They're exactly the same from a physical point of view. The test environment is exactly the same. The difference is one group of rat is living in the test environment, so they are tested in the home cage. Another group is transferred to the test environment just for the, for the testing. So one group is tested at home. The other group is tested outside the home. So this is the, the difference in setting. No difference whatsoever in, in the environment, in the circadian rhythms. The animals are not even transported from one room to another. At the time it was possible, we were doing this in the animal facility. So the animal was transferred from one environment to another 50 centimeter distance. So, okay, so forget about difference in the social environment. These animals were uh, li uh, living in isolation. A lot of these experiments now cannot be done anymore because the ethics committee will jump at you. How come you keep the animal, the rats, isolated for 24 hours? Okay. Forget the kids dying in the sea, crossing the, the Mediterranean, they can die, but a rat, God forbid, can suffer staying alone in a cage. So we did a series of experiments. I'm going to show you only some data and uh, mm, the representative data, but we did these experiments over and over and over. My, my, mm, my, my, mm, let me say, my, my code of conduct in science is replication. 
like never trust just a single experiment. So this is an experiment in which rats received an injection of amphetamine, two milligram per kilogram IP, and this is the time course of the response in animals that were testing outside the, the home environment. So now from, home, from now on, the color code is red for outside the home environment and blue for at home. And this was the response in animal tested at home. So now th 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 my initial uh, intuition uh, was confirmed by uh, a, a, a controlled experimental setting. Huge difference. Then I thought maybe if the animal receiving the drug at home received the drug without even being handled, so we set up an intravenous line, we could administer the drug r controlling remotely the injection. So the rats didn't even realize they were being injected with the drug. And now the difference became even larger, so much for pharmacology. The drug is the same, supposedly the receptors are the same, the physical environment is the same, the difference in the response is huge. The, 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 the response to novelty was negligible in both situations. I'm going to show you this, this later on. Okay, so big differences. And uh, so was clear that the, 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 the setting of drug administration made a big difference in the behavioral response to drugs. Mind you, psychomotor activity supposedly a proxy for the rewarding effect of drugs. So true that still now, many people study the psychomotor response to drugs and they think that they're studying the rewarding effects. Okay, so we did also experiment by, uh, with repeated administration. These are seven con consecutive injection of amphetamine uh, and followed by a challenge injection to animals that have been pretreated with saline or amphetamine. So this is the response over seven consecutive injection to amphetamine outside the home environment. This is what happened when you inject the animal with saline, nothing. Now you challenge the animal with the, an injection of amphetamine, so both the saline pretreated and the amphetamine pretreated, and this difference in response to the challenge is an index of sensitization. So you can, you can look at sensitization both uh, uh, across treatment days and in response to a challenge. This, this phenomenon was much smaller in animal tested at home. So not only the acute response to drug, to amphetamine, was smaller at home than outside the home, but also the development of sensitization. Supposedly, an index of the neuroplastic changes responsible for the transition to addiction. So the, in the next slides, you are going to see some of these uh, yellow arrows indicating sensitization. And we did this experiment several times with different uh, drugs. So several times with amphetamine, you always see the yellow arrow much bigger in the outside the home environment. With cocaine, we did with morphine, we did with heroin, every time the same thing. So at the bottom, you find a list of all the papers in which we have studied this phenomenon, replicating over and over and over. So all uh, in major drugs of abuse, opioids and psychostimulants, basically. Okay, what could be the reason for this? So obvious suspect, dopamine. So we set up experiments with using in vivo macrodialysis, and we measure dopamine concentration in the relevant brain areas, which, is, which are the regional subdivision of the striatum. So, and this data, I already showed you this data, and the reason I selected this data because in these animals, we also did microdialysis in view. So th these are the same animals. So these are two groups of animals. What I'm saying is that the data for dopamine concentration is the same of the behavioral data. So we tested the nucleus accumbens, no difference in uh, dopamine release. Dorsal striatum, no difference. Nucleus accumbens shell, no difference. Dorsal striatum, no difference. So you can get huge difference in behavioral response to drugs, no difference in dopamine release. Notice here that the response to, dopa to uh, amphetamine, the psychomotor response is very, very small, but the, the response in terms of dopamine release was exactly the same of animal tested outside the home environment. So this is a, a big issue about the role of dopamine. Actually, the role of dopamine 
has not been investigated really with the goal of testing an hypothesis, but more with the goal of confirming an hypothesis. So true that every time something is published, sort of reducing the role of dopamine and the rewarding effect of drugs, these results are always questioned because they are contradicting a theory. The problem with theory is that they, uh, they, are, uh, they, they can be failed only, they cannot be confirmed. So we should pay much more in, in attention to negative data, so-called negative data, because this is really the real test for a theory. Oh, mind you, that I was in Terry Robinson lab, who was uh, the high priest of dopaminergic transmission, psychomotor activity, role of dopamine, drug reward, and so on. Notice that. But Terry is a gentleman, so for him, data are data. Doesn't matter what is the theoretical background. So he could admit that also his theory was wrong. Oh, if it's not dopamine, there might be some, probably something downstream from dopaminergic transmission. So as you know, there are uh, dopaminerg uh, GABergic projection, medium spiny neurons, in the striatum, projecting back to the output nuclei of basal ganglia. There are two major pathways. In this, in this slide, I'm not representing all the collaterals. The things are much more complex than here. But basically, there is a direct projection system projecting directly back, back to the uh, substantia nagra, so, uh, ventral tegmental area, and uh, globus pallidus pars interna, and an in indirect system projecting to the globus pallidus of pars externa, then to the subthalamic nucleus, and then to the output nuclear basal ganglia. And these two uh, projection systems produce, uh, modulate the output nuclei in, in a very different manner. So what we did, we used uh, in situ hybridization using different type of markers to investigate uh, neuron activation as indicated by CFOS, CFOS expression in, sub, in these two subpopulation sub of medial spiny neuron. And I'm going to show you just a few data here. Uh, so these are the, the first data we collected. It was a huge experiment. At the time, the experiment with the in situ hybridization and double in situ hybridization were conducted in two, three, four rats with, uh, with the doses of drugs that were producing an effect. Forget about whether they were relevant from a behavioral point of view. We didn't. Fortunately, we were collaborating with Huda Kiel, who has the, the largest... Uh, um, um, actually, she, she was a pioneer for in situ hybridization. So we did, we did experiments with dozens of dozens, of about 100 rats we tested. We, we, test, we, we, we mapped the entire brain from, uh, from, the, from the most uh, uh, rostral portion to the most caudal portion. And as I said, I'm going to show you only a few data. These are concerning the um, D1 medium spiny neurons. And what we found is that despite the fact that these animals, dopamine levels were the same, we found a difference in the level of CFOS expression depending on whether amphetamine was administered at home or outside the home. Well, okay. But the most, the most interesting thing was that uh, when we uh, lesioned the dopaminergic system, so this animal had a unilateral lesion of dopaminergic system, so we were measuring rotation, and this gave a chance to measure the role of dopamine in this kind of response. You see, a lesion of uh, six hydroxy dopamine lesion of the dopaminergic neurons completely abolished CFOS expression. Then we look at the two neurons. And look at this. Virtually no expression induced by amphetamine per se. Large increase in CFOS expression when animals receive the same dose of the drug at outside the home. Now we went back to the literature, and all the literature was uh, in agreement that amphetamine psychostimulant drugs increase CFOS expression only in D1 uh, medium spiny neurons, which are the, um, the, 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 uh, the neurons of the uh, direct projection system. Wha only one paper found that there was an increase al also in D2 neurons, the one we were projecting indirectly to the, bus to the output nuclei. Guess what? In that paper, the animals were taken out of their own cage, transferred to the another test environment, received the drug, and then the, their brain were taken out for in situ hybridization. Of course, from the point of view of molecular bi biologists and pharmacologists, what, what kind of difference could make, whether they got the injection in their own cage 
or I'll say the home cage. It was amphetamine induced the increase in C4 suppression. And in this case, dopamine lesion didn't do anything. Actually, there was a incre further increase in uh, false expression, of course, because when dopamine acts on D2 receptors, you have a transactional cascade with GI protein, so you have a reduction in cellular activity. So where this information is coming from? Probably from the cortex and other brain area, but I'm not getting into this, into this uh, issue now. What I'm going to show you, another thing, uh, we replicated this experiment with, uh, in, in animal without a, a unilateral lesion, we did it with cocaine, always the same finding in D2 neurons. And then we, we tested also CFOS expression in the subthalamic nucleus. Why? Because if there is an increase in, in activity of D2-like neurons, you should have a disinhibition of subthalamic nucleus nuc uh, neurons. And indeed, this was actually what we found, with both with cocaine and with amphetamine. So the increase in force expression in the subthalamic nucleus was much greater outside the home than at home. So within limits, this model was, was very consistent. Okay, uh, spent many years in Terry Robinson lab. I moved back to Rome in 19, at the end of the 1990s, set up my lab, and I set up probably the first big self-administration lab in Italy. So we had... Uh, for doing the experiment I wanted to do, we need many self-administration chambers. So after a few years, I had 48 self-administration chambers. Of course, the animal had to live in the test environment. What we, why we were interested in the self-administration? Because that's a direct index of reward. It's not psychomotor activity. And when we talk about reward, let me, let me say a few things about reward. Uh, many people use reward as the same, as uh, equivalent to reinforcement. But reinforcement is actually a definition coming from behavioral pharmacology is based on the frequency of a behavior. So a reinforcer increases the frequency of a given behavior. It has nothing to do with what is going on in the brain. Some people thought that, of course, to increase the frequency of a behavior, it means that the behavior was somewhat pleasurable. But these are inferences. So you need another level of analysis. And uh, indeed, Terry Robinson and Ken Berridge, and especially Ken Berridge, pointed out that the reward has different components. And Ken Berridge hypothesized that there was an affective component, so-called liking, and, uh, and, and a, a so-called incentive salience component. They had to do with wanting the drug, which sounds strange because you think that w you like what you want, you want what you like, but actually this is not always the case, like psychiatrists can confirm easily, right? So. Uh, I'm not going to use this terminology, liking and wanting, because the, over the years has become charged with implication about psychological constructs, and many people are sort of uh, are resistant to this kind of terminology. So I took terminology straight from behavioral economics. So as you know, Kahneman got a Nobel Prize in economy. The only psychologist who got a Nobel Prize in economy, of course. There is not a Nobel Prize in uh, psychology. And he got a Nobel Prize for great ideas including this minor idea that they dig out of the literature in which they were went, went back to Bentham notion of utility in economy and distinguishing between experience utility. So similar to the liking of Cambridge, but without any assumption about the, the, the processes involved, versus decision utility, which you can study by looking at the output, the behavioral output of people, what they do. So on the one level is what you feel. Another level is what you do. So from now on, I'm going to use experience utility to refer to the affective sphere and decision utility looking at the behavioral output. The, the, the experimental setup was similar to, um, to what we have seen previously for psychomotor activity. The only difference is this time we had self-administration chambers. Also in this case, some animals were self-administering the drug at home, others outside the home. So the first experiment we did was, uh, some of the first experiments were done with cocaine. This is self-administration over a period of seven days with increasing fixed ratio. That is, uh, the animal had to press more and more to get a single injection of the drug. So fixed ratio five, it means the animal had to press five times consecutively on a lever 
to get an injection of, of the drug. There is also another lever, the so-called inactive lever. If the animal were pressing on that lever, they were getting an injection or selling or nothing, and they were setting the counter on the active lever. So on FR5, you're really sure that the animal is pressing for the drug. It's not just, not just bumping in the drug. So this is self-administration of cocaine at home, and this self-administration for cocaine outside the home. Wow, we found exactly the same things that we found with psychomotor activity, exactly what we expected. At the time, I was still a true believer, aside from dopamine. Uh, pressures on the inactive liver, negligible. So they're really going for the drug here. So now we, did the, we didn't study only a dose of the drug. This is the dose of 400 micrograms. We did also other dose, in all, all in independent groups. So this study, in this initial study was about 100, more than 100 animals, who were which, were uh, which were trained with different uh, 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 unit doses of uh, cocaine. And you can see a shift to the left in the self-administration curve. Now, those effect curve in behavior in the area of pharmacology are not the same things of those effect curve in in vitro experiment. It's a, very difficult to interpret. But since we're not interested in now in extrapolating the meaning of the shift, we can just say that there's a shift to the left. Okay. What is going to happen with heroin? Because for clearly the, re, the, the the decision utility of cocaine is greater outside the home than at home. Now, what about heroin? Similar experiment with heroin, uh, and this is uh, the self-administration of atom, and this is outside the home. Oh, now it's completely the opposite, which was a big, big wow. So true that we replicated this experiment many times. Actually, the very first drug I used was, um, was morphine, and uh, I, I didn't find the same thing, the, the, what I expected. I was expecting with morphine to find like for psychomotor activity, more self-administration outside the home. We didn't get it, and we said, oh, maybe morphine is, is, I mean, is, is a problem. Let's, let's, let's do cocaine, and we got what we expected. Then we did it with heroin, and now, so the, 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 the pilot finding with morphine was not a chance. Really, the animal like heroin at home more than heroin outside the home. And look at the dose effect curve. Completely different. There is a, now there is a shift Upward or downward, you decide it. Okay, so now we, have, we, 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 we had many experiments we could do, and I'm going to show only a few of these experiments. Uh, I'm going to show choice experiment. So what's going to happen in animal when they have the choice to self-administer heroin or cocaine, giving them the choice in between the two, at home or outside the home? So what we did, we trained the animals to self-administer heroin and cocaine on alternate days. When they heroin, when they cocaine, when they heroin, when they cocaine. Of course, we counterbalance everything that could be counterbalanced here. Some animals were tested only, were trained only with heroin, and some animals only with cocaine. Then we gave them a period of withdrawal, a period of washout, and then we gave them the choice every 10 minutes, cocaine or heroin, cocaine or heroin and so on, every 10 minutes, for several sessions. So at the end, we had more than 100 uh, uh, choices, and we could, we could use a simple bootstrapping technique to allocate the animal to a cocaine-preferring group or a heroin-preferring group. Or, uh, on average, okay, roughly, when the animal uh, uh, took more than two-thirds injection of one drug, they were considered as thus a preferred drug. So more than two-thirds of your uh, infusion were of heroin, then you were heroin preferring rat, and uh, the contrary for cocaine. Just to give you an idea how we decided the animal were cocaine and, or heroin preferring. It was no, no 49 to 51. Usually it was something like 80 versus 20 or something like that. Sometimes 100 out of 100. In the next slide, I'm going to show the bars that, that visualize the, the proportion of animal preferring one drug versus the other. So this is what happened at home. More animal prefer heroin at home than animal preferring cocaine. Some, some animals didn't make up their minds. A little bit of that. Right? 
40 to 60, 60 to 40, that it was not relevant. They make up the math. Outside the home, oh, the animal like cocaine much more than heroin, much more. Now the most surprising thing is that when we tested animals who had experience only with heroin or cocaine, so they didn't have any, any idea about the other drug, they did more or less exactly the same thing. So look at these animals. These animals have been trained with heroin. And indeed, they prefer heroin at home. But look what's happening outside the home. And the same with animals trained with cocaine. So it's not only a matter of taking more drugs when you're at home, taking more heroin at home than when you're outside the home. You really w prefer the drug relative to cocaine. OK. Uh, so far, I've talked only about decision utility. So we were looking at the behavior of the animal and uh, measuring utility only in the, on the basis of their decisions. So they could press on a lever or not pressing on the lever. They could press for uh, cocaine or, or, or for cocaine. Always a matter of decision. Now we can ask the question about experience utility. Now, how you test experience utility in animal? You cannot ask the animal how much you liked it. It's, it's, it's very tricky. So there is only one measure, which is ultrasonic vocalization in the range of, the range of 50 kilohertz. Not everybody likes this measure of, aff of affect, but we don't have anything else. We don't have any other measure of drug affect. And this, indeed, this, 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 uh, this, uh, this, this um, proce procedure has been used repeatedly to measure the effective response to drug. And um, now I'm going to show you the, uh, the emission of uh, 50 kilohertz in the range of 50 kilohertz ultrasonic vocalization when animals self-administer heroin or cocaine. Now notice the animal, the data for cocaine are collected in the same animals in which we're going to show the data also for heroin. Okay? The data are expressed as a difference from uh, baseline. So these animals um, were also tested under uh, extinction conditions, self-administering saline. So they were pressing the liver and getting saline. So we were measuring the delta in ultrasonic vocalization around the injection time. We're taking the few seconds before the injection, few seconds after the injection, and measuring vocalization. So these experiments are incredibly time consuming, and extremely difficult to conduct. When we collaborated with uh, Maria Luisa Scattoni at the Institute Superior di Sanità, because she was the high priestess of uh, ultrasonic vocalization, which is very tricky. Also because there is no automatic analysis of this data. You need the person sitting in front of the computer looking at the, sp at the spectrogram of vocalization and deciding uh, which were the, 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 the 50 kilohertz and measuring them. Hellish work. Fortunately, I found a PhD student who was willing to undergo this torture, uh, Riccardo Avvisati, and this is the fi uh, our findings. So these are the first 10 intravenous injections, self-administration of heroin at home. See, especially the first, for the first few injections, you get increase in ultrasonic vocalization, especially after the injection. So the empty bar is before, and the, the, the filled bar is after the injection. What about outside the home? Ah, not nearly as much. And actually, there is sometimes there is also a decrease relative to the, to the saline injection. Same animals, cocaine. Cocaine at home, cocaine outside the home. So the opposite pattern. Well, I was pleased, let me tell you. So even experience utility seems to be larger at home for heroin and outside the home for cocaine. Now, now, I was starting to wonder where in the brain could, could neurobiological changes induced by drugs explain for these differences. Now, these are the data I already showed you. After I left Ken Terry Robinson lab, they did an experiment with morphine, because in the States they have the strange idea that morphine is the same thing as heroin. It isn't. It isn't. Just published a review, reviewing all the, the difference in between the difference metabolite of heroin, and as you know very well, right? And uh, so, 
uh, he was not the reviewer, but because he's interested in the in the role of opioids. Uh, so this is with uh, with uh, with amphetamine and cocaine, and this is what happened with morphine. Opposite changes. So even at the neurobiological level, you can find the dissociation. Terry, when published this data, didn't have my self-administration data to go by. So true that this is a re-elaboration of the data published. They, they really couldn't, they couldn't understand why things were looking so different, okay? Then when we publish our, our data, say, oh, now things start to make sense. And we found differences in, in, in this double dissociation in the, in the response to drugs in different parts of the brain. I'm not going to get into that especially in the, in the amygdala, in the subnuclei of the amygdala. But now it's time to move from rats to humans. Let's get translational here for real, real translation, which means using people with substance use disorder. So one of the reasons I'm always skeptical about data coming out from uh, even very prestigious lab in the States in which they're studying people with addiction is that they recruit people on their last leg, because they pay them. And guess whether you can pay uh, a, a person to participate in a study that require the person not to be at home for a period of time, to stop working, to stop doing other things. Basically, they are, they are recruiting people, often not even with a diagnosis of substance use disorder, but just with the story of drug use. Sometimes it's very, very sketchy. And sometimes you have professional participants in study people who participate in several studies. So uh, I have a big problem in trusting the, 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 many of these studies. So we went, we collaborated with Villa Marini in Rome, which is probably the largest addiction clinic in Europe. They have thousands of clients and they provide services of no, almost no question asked except the fact of being a drug addict. Okay. And they provide service for free. So we, we could recruit people that were interesting for, to us. In particular, they need to have a residence. You cannot get a person from the street and throw it in the study because you need to have a person who has a home and has an outside home. A person with, I wouldn't say normal life because people would, uh, with opioid or cocaine addiction, usually many of them do not, do not live very long. Many of them can survive, many of them you don't even get to know them because they don't even get enrolled in services. They remain substance use for the entire life and you will never guess that they were addicted to drugs. Hmm? Okay, so we did studies with people with dual substance use disorder, cocaine and heroin use disorder. Diagnosed made by, not by us, but by the physicians of Villa Marini. So they were followed by people at Villa Marini. And then we asked them, the same utility. When you take heroin, where do you prefer taking the drug? And when you take cocaine? Now, mind you, there are no individual differences here. They are exactly the same people taking both drugs in separate instances. No snowballing. There is no, there is no, there is no co assumption. We, we looked only at separate in, uh, uh, uses of drugs. So, where you do it more often, uh, heroin or cocaine? Of course, they have no idea why we're asking these questions. No idea whatsoever. And this was the reply. I couldn't believe my luck. So when we asked about cocaine, most of them say, I prefer using cocaine outside the home. A few of them, I thought, it's never all or none. There are also always people doing different things. We still have a problem to, to deal with individual differences, amazingly. We like have, have everything black and white, but it's not like that. So, but there's a prevalence of people preferring heroin, uh, doing cocaine outside the home. The same people, they prefer doing heroin at home. Before you start to think, oh, but injecting heroin, snorting cocaine, no, 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 no. Even if you take only the snorters, you still face the same effects. Only the intravenous, the main liners, you still find the same effects. Uh, if you look at people who are taking the drugs in the presence of other people, social users, you still find the same effect. Okay. So now even the decision utility in humans seems to be different for heroin and cocaine, depending on the environment. Now we, we ask about experience utility. How do you go about asking the, the, about this, the experience utility in humans? You can ask them, how do you like it? But 
this is not very reliable uh, as, a quest, uh, as a question because when you engage cognitive system, now you engage all sorts of, uh, of, of cognitive processes. People who do drugs, usually they feel guilty. They try to please the experimenter somehow. They, so you can really trust very much this kind of, uh, of, of reply. I think it, the, the scientists are too skeptical about the, uh, the, the information uh, participant and patient provide to them which is strange because after all the business of psychiatry is, is to talk with people and to get information out of people. So it's, it's, it's bizarre the notion that so you, you look at DSM-5, you get your, uh, your information, then you do the experiments where you cannot trust what people are telling you. Usually if I ask people, what did, what did you eat for lunch? I tend to trust them. Unless I know they have a problem with, uh, with eating, with food, with, uh, with weight or things like that. But there are no good reason to, to mistrust them, I usually trust them. So anyway, to, to play on the safe, uh, um, we decided to use another system. Actually, I didn't think about it. But a st student at the time working with me, Silvana De Pirro, she's one, I was very lucky in finding people very, very good at what they were doing. Daniele Caprioli, who is now an associate professor at Sapienza, set up my self-administration lab. He was running the lab. I, I, I was just thinking about experiments to do, and Daniela was taking care of everything. In this case, I had a, an incredibly creative person. So when we wonder how to measure experience utility, she came up with a, a very, a very uh, interesting idea. She went back to uh, the sick complex model of office by, proposed by Russell in many years ago, uh, in which he proposed a bidimensional uh, model in which you were measuring pleasant or unpleasantness of the, of the state and the state of arousal. So you go from sedation to arousal. So then you can, you can design a, a model in which you can ask people, when you take heroin, maybe at home, in which of these four quadrants would will, 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 will position yourself? And we, we equip the, the, the test with, with these emoticons just to increase the intuitivity. So in this case, not, not much of cognitive processing the people were just pointing to a quadrant. Actually, we gave them the possibility to point to more than one quadrant, one of my, one more of the, of the, of the, the section of the pie. Notice the yellow and green as positive valence, blue and red is negative valence. So in this case, blue and red do not mean at home or at home. It's a different kind of color code. And these are the data. This is heroin at home. Mind you, these are dual co-abusers. So it, the, the, the four quadrants I'm going to show to you are from exactly the same people. So this is their experience of cocaine at home. Look at how bigger is the positive affect produced by heroin at home relative to outside the home. Then you may ask, oh, if you don't like it, why you are taking it? Remember, not always you like what you want, you want what you like. Uh, for this idea, Ken Berridge and Terry Robinson got the equivalent of uh, the Nobel Prize in Psychology from the American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychological Association. So this is a shift, a very highly significant shift, predicted by the model, by the way. And with cocaine, exactly the opposite. The exactly the opposite. We are looking at how much the people like the drug or experience utility, not how much they wanted the drugs. They of, of course they wanted the drugs. They were doing it. So they must have wanted it, right? Okay. So big difference in experience utility in between the two contexts. Oh, the, the last piece of data I'm going to show you from a lab was a brain imaging study. Now doing brain imaging study in people with substance use disorder is pure hell. First you have to recruit them. Then you have to find the facilities willing to accept it. So uh, I'm going to, uh, it took me only a few years to do this experiment. We have to select people. For example, we have to select people who are not bothered excessively by the noise of the scanner. You have to select people who are good at the visual imagery. Some people are not good at visual imagery because we are going to ask them not to get an injection of drugs, but to think about taking the drug. These are all people with dual substance use disorder. Um, so at the end, we, and we, of course, we need people with a home. Uh, most of these people have regular jobs. Only a few people were unemployed, they were home. All bona fide addict with the diagnosis. Um, 
we put in a scanner and then we ask them repeatedly, think about being at home, for example, or outside the home, depending, we, we, there was a, a counterbalance to order. Then think about taking a certain drugs in this environment, let's say heroin. Notice this is a block design. Many, many people criticize this, this design, but you have to add the, the, the procedure to your testing hypothesis, not the other way around as many people do. Okay, so 60 seconds, which is an eternity, thinking about being at home. Then two minutes thinking of getting the drug at home. These are people who know what are the effects of heroin. And they can think about taking heroin at home. They've done it. They've done everything. So we did cocaine at home, cocaine outside the home, all, all everything counterbalanced and repeated. And at the end, I'm going to show you some synthetic uh, representation of this data. So we did this study with the Taliban of uh, brain imaging who said, no, no, no region of interest. I'm not going to trust the region of interest. You are going to run statistics bottom up, whatever you find significant, then there's the, and we use a very strict significance level. And we found only three regions in which there was a significant interaction in between drug, visual imagery related to drug and environment, and where the Lateral prefrontal cortex, actually many subregions of the lateral prefrontal cortex is represented only the BA44. The left, uh, no, the lateral, sorry, the left uh, prefrontal cortex, then the lateral caudate, and then the cerebellum bilaterally, but here they did only for the left cerebellum. So the, the fear analysis is not really time course, but it gives you an idea how the bull signal changes over time. I don't know when many of you are familiar with uh, fMRI. So you can see here how the ball signal changed now. Assuming that the ball signal reflects neuronal activity, because with, with, uh, with fMRI you have to make a series of assumptions. Now is increasing ball signal and increasing activity? Probably yes, but it's not that perfectly clear, by the way. It's not perfectly clear, especially in an area in which there are many neurons. So if you have an increase, which neurons exactly increase activity? And what about the neurons in which there was an increase, in, uh, neurons in which there was an increase and versus neurons in which there was a decrease? So that there is a, that then there is a wash. You should find that no, the algebraic sum is zero. So there are a lot of problems. But what is interesting here is that first, this is a within subjects study, no individual differences. Second, that all the, the, the changes Regardless of their meaning, the meaning of the bull signal change were exactly the opposite for the two drugs as a function of environment. So you see the, the three brain ideas, how the, the signal changed in opposite direction. This is the, br the human brain. So this was this really full translation, full translation. Why? Brief theoretical interlude. So since nobody theorized anything compatible with these results, I had to theorize it myself. I'm, I'm much more in the, in the area of uh, experimentation. I want to test hypotheses. I don't care whether the data are consistent with the hypothesis or not. I want to test the hypothesis. But since there was no uh, theory, I had to develop an explanation. Otherwise, I mean, people really are not interested in facts. They want to model a theory. So this is my theory. Usually you think about drug reward in terms of the drug. Some brain areas, they process the psychological, uh, the effective response to the drug, and then you get decision utility, okay? I'm, I'm not representing here condition stimuli, uh, all complications, but the very bottom line, if you take a drug, you experiment something, then that something must drive you to take the drug. Even though Terry Robinson and Cambridge hypothesized that the drugs can act directly on the decision utility circuitry, which, which, they think who the, uh, which they think depends on dopamine transmission. But this is another level of complication. Okay, so this is the, si the simple representation. But this is not what's happening really in the real world. In the real world, you don't have the, the bra only the brain area processing the effect of drugs. You have uh, all that is surrounding the drug, the internal environment, the drugs can act also in the rest of the body. And you have information coming from the rest of the body. And you have the external environment. 
what is the, 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 the experience utility of drugs? Well, this is another blurred field of, uh, of investigation. There is very little in the literature about what the, in what sense the drug are really pleasurable. So all the drugs are the same. What does it mean? When you smoke a cigarette, you feel the same pleasure of taking heroin or cocaine? I don't think so. Is the fact of uh, cannabis the same of amphetamine? I don't think so. So I, I, I think we should think about the, the, the experience utility of drugs in a much more broader manner. So you, have, you can have intense feeling of blacks, bliss and ecstasy if you take the drug intravenously. Or you can have a, a more prolonged sense of contentment, especially, especially with opioids or alcohol over a certain period of time. But then there are also the fact like sedation or arousal, ansiolysis or uh, anxiety, analgesia or pain, other interoceptive effects that should be computed into the experience utility of drugs. And what about the other two parts of the equation, the external environment? There is everything. Everything is really relevant in the real world, alt presence of alternative rewards. Some people, uh, when I was seeing drugs addicts regularly, I was asking them, why, why you keep on doing Actually, I was not asking this stupid question, but some of my colleagues, oh, you're still doing drugs at your age. Uh, you don't have anything else in, the, in your life. No, I don't have anything else. That's it. That's it, only that. Uh, social environment, cultural environment, legal environment. How many of you smoke? Nobody. One. Okay, if I, if I tell you that now there is that penalty on smoking, instantaneous, without any process, I, don't, I think you will quit smoking. Sad. I don't believe in punishment, but to give you an idea how the legal environment can, uh, can affect uh, the, the drug taking. Right? So there's also legal environment, and then there are other aspects, like stressors. The surroundings, this is what I've, I've talked about the interrelation. Simply the, the physical surround, the psychological surrounding, and so on. What about internal environment? You name it. Temperament, personality. I put temperament and personality because there is a big issue where temperament and personality are the same things, two facets of the same aspects. Forget it. Temperament. So more about genetics and personality, more about phenotype. And psychiatric status. Dual diagnosis is a big issue, it's a big problem. And, and m many people with drug addiction have a problem in receiving treatment because they go to the psychiatrist with, I don't know, depression or psychosis. Then they discover that also take amphetamine or another drug. Or, or then you have to see first the, the, you know, uh, the uh, a cert or, uh, or, a, or a drug addiction specialist. And, and then you, can buy, you go to the drug addiction specialist. Or, or, or but I can see that you have a diagnosis of, psych of psychosis. Or the, or, so these people are in a limbo. They don't receive appropriate treatment. And this neglected still now the role of self-medication for in drug use. Okay, uh, sex and gender of course play a role. Eighty percent of cocaine addicts are male still now. For many different reasons, people of, often think about sex. But they think more about gender. These are cultural factors. That they, uh, that Notice that the external environment can affect also the internal environment uh, in the shape of phenotype, of course. So it's the past history of, of exposure. Uh, physiological status. What is your, 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 your internal status at the moment? The pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics of the drugs, individual uh, uh, differences at the level, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. All these things usually is completely neglected. You take the drug. The drug acts on the brain, increasing dopamine transmission, neuroplastic changes, voila. You have an addict. I'm going to, to, to propose a, 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 a way in which this different factor can interact. So let's, first of all, often it is uh, a, a, a neglected the, inf the, in the effect of drugs on the internal environment outside the, outside the brain. But the drugs have effect on the internal environment outside the brain. And, and this can trigger interoceptive responses or interceptive processing of these effects. So for example, when we took our people with substance use disorder and we asked them, okay, how do you feel under the effect of heroin uh, for heart rate, respiratory rate, and so on? And then how you felt uh, under the effect of cocaine? 
and you find that these two drugs produce almost the opposite pattern. We are talking about interoception here. We are not measuring anything, which would be really a difficult thing to do. We are asking them how they felt. This is what they felt. Forget about what was, if they really had an increase in heart rate, but they were feeling an increase in heart rate and so on. So now, here my hypothesis. You get heroin, you get decrease in heart rate, decrease in respiratory rate, and decrease in muscle tension. Hmm? All nice effect if you are in a safe, protected environment. You're at home, relaxed. Eh? So in this case, sedation is something positive. You're telling about warm contentment, you're at home. Increase in decision utility. But if you, uh, you experience the same effects in an external environment, which might be potentially also dangerous. You have to be, you have to be vigilant. Now, here you have a mismatch in between the internal environment and the external environment. Better about the interoception, interoception and exteroception. And this mismatch makes some of the effects produced by heroin negative. You decrease experience utility, you, you decrease decision utility. The contrary with cocaine, Increase in, in heart rate, respiratory rate, in arousal, increase in muscle tension. Outside the home environment, that's fine, it's okay. But if you're at home, many people experience this as a mismatch. And now you decrease the decision and utility. Okay, this is my theoretical elaboration. You may like it or not, but this is my, my proposal. Now, lo and behold, I was assisted by the mother of all natural experiments in the shape of COVID-19 epidemics, which produce huge lockdown. Now I'm not talking about, I don't know, 100 rats or 100 hu 200 humans like we studied. Now we have millions of people, and, we have, and, there, and there are online systems to ask them which drug we were taking. Besides the fact that you can monitor certain drug use from measuring the content of drug in sewers, so you have an indirect confirmation. So all I'm going to show you is confirmed by data provided by, I say, in Italy, if you want to know how much alcohol you use, you can ask the Monopoly di Stato. Because alcohol is, nobody is, is brewing alcohol in the, in the cellar here. Okay? And you can measure cocaine in the sewers and so on. So when they asked people what they were doing, there was, during lockdown, increase in sedative drugs, including opioids, and a decrease in psychostimulant drugs. And when they asked them why you did this, many of the, the answers were consistent with our model. In particular, I don't like using this drug at home for cocaine and MDMA. So experience utility and decision utility from this natural experiment. Last thing, just to, to, to point out the importance of the environment. Now, uh, Let's take a drug that can produce addiction. And let's take alcohol. I'm going to talk about alcohol now, briefly. Alcohol use disorder, right? This is a bona fide DSM-5 condition, correct? Mm? So it's a psychiatric condition. But it's quite different from other psychiatric conditions. Let's take psychosis or depression. There are, difference, there are regional differences in, in the prevalence of uh, depression or psychosis. Yes, but they're not very big. There are no huge differences, right? Uh, many of the differences can be explained uh, additionally by environmental factors easy to identify, like nutritional factors or infectious infection, etc. But look, now I'm going to show the data for alcohol use disorder. In particular, I'm going to focus first on heavy drinking session and then on, on, on alcohol use disorder. Heavy drinking session. So many of you already have an idea of this. This is the difference from country. Let me, let me give you some, we are in Europe. Let's point out at Europe. Okay, now, for a psychiatric condition, because this is part of uh, alcohol use disorder, you go from 53.7 in, 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 in Finland versus 6.2 in Italy. And then in Italy, Trieste versus Palermo. When I was a kid, I spent two years in Trieste. And for the first time, I also drunk people in the street. For the first time. I was asking my mother, who are those people? Hey, I'm going to explain you later. 
I was in, in Rome, I never saw people drunk in the streets. I know that there are some people can get drunk, but the idea that Saturday night, you can have a lot of people walking on the street, uh, wobbling on, the, was in Palermo, it's close to zero, the chance. So there are regional, it's not that the Italians are good and nice, simply there are regional differences. And this pattern can change any time because it changes with, with, the, with the cultural uh, pro profile of the, of the place. Okay, so this is heavy drinking. This is alcohol use disorder. Okay, Wh what is the psychiatric condition in which the, this, there is a difference, a tenfold difference in the prevalence of the disorder? I don't know, do you know it? No. So what the difference could be? The number of abstemious people in England, in Italy, is more or less the same. That is, all these people have been exposed to alcohol. How many of you are completely abstemious? I guess most of you are social drinkers, which means that you have been repeatedly exposed to the drug, which means, according to the model, the, 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 unifying, the grand unifying theory, these drugs must have acted on the dopaminergic system, producing neuroplastic adaptation, and so at least some of you should have, been, should have become uh, affected by alcohol use disorder. So why the prevalence is so different? Because it's different the way in which we drink. It's different the, way, the cultural environment. We continuously neglect the importance of this factor, which is huge compared. So sometimes you see studies in which there is a, a decrease of 10% of something significant, P0001. FSI is completely negligible. So this is what we should pay more attention to. The, the, all that is around drugs when we, ta we talk about drug addiction. So this the, the, the conclusion are very simple, but the implications are really deep because the neurobiological response to addictive drugs is shaped by the setting of drug use means that uh, it, is n it, it, is, it is ridiculous to point out only the molecular effect of drugs, only the, 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 the immediate pharmacological action. Drug-induced psychomotor activity is not an index of drug reward. I, I'm sure that many would agree with that. There is not a big problem, but people are still affectionate. Some people are still affectionate to this notion. And finally, addictive drugs are not the same. When I hear, oh, I'm against all drugs. Uh, do you drink? Oh, yes. Oh, but that's legal. Hello? So it is legal to use a cancerogenic drug. You go to the tobacconist, you buy a bona fide cancerogenic, one of the most powerful cancerogenic substances. You pay for it. It is legal. Then, God forbid, you use LSD or mushrooms. How many people died of, of mushroom intoxication in the last 30 years in Italy? Zero. Many, people, many more people die of tobacco smoking or alcohol drinking than of heroin taking. Actually, Italy is the country with, with the lowest prevalence of overdoses in the world. We measure overdoses in the, in the hundreds, two, three hundreds per year, and declining. Whereas in other countries, are much more prohibitionistic countries going up. Okay, these are the people who I should thank for this data, and especially Daniele Caprioli and Silvana De Piro. Daniele is a social professor at the University of Europe Sapienza, and Silvana is a postdoc at, uh, in Oslo. Okay, thank you very much. Grazie. Thank you very much. Uh, you did a magnificent uh, lecture. It's uh, really amazing uh, your work and uh, especially what you did uh, in uh, elucidating such a complex, uh, such a complex uh, field. Uh, of, uh, of research, but as well something that is uh, very close to everybody. So I would like to know if there are questions, because I have a couple of, but Andrea? Or no, no, but it was a person at the back was. As a chair of the department, I, I took a Thank habit you. to, first of all, ask the young people. Uh, congratulations for the talk. 
Let's, uh, let's keep the congratulations great <laughs> talk as I'm allergic okay. to this kind. I have a question of curiosity. Uh, do you think that um, uh, if you add um, um, a mouse uh, a social interaction uh, in the cage, uh, mm, you, can, uh, you, you could change the preference of a mouse uh, at home or uh, outside? Okay, so we did experiments in the way we did because we want to have full control on the, on the setting, right? And all animals were all lived in isolation and they were, uh, uh, they were tested in isolation. Mm -hmm. The kind of experiments you suggested could be done. And indeed, over the period of many decades, some of my students and associates suggested to do those experiments. You have always have to choose what to do. Mm -hmm. So we went down a certain line, we ignored all the other possibilities. But I must say that when we saw that in humans, because after all we're studying animal models, mm -hmm. when in humans we found that it didn't make much of a difference, so then sort of it, it, it became less pressing, this kind of issue. Mm. So but it's definitely possible. That we the environment uh, um, can be uh, also the sociali sociability uh, in the cage. So the, mm, the mouse can uh, remember No, the no, no, no mouse. Ah. Mouse are the stupid version of rats. Yes. So I'm talking <laughs> about those the smart, they are not smelly, right. they're nice, they, are, they don't bite you. The, the mice are the other okay. one, the small one, the nasty one. Right. Sorry for, I know that <laughs> most of you are uh, ratolo uh, topology. <laughs> um, so also a curiosity for uh, if you think that uh, um, there is a, a, a change of uh, preference uh, if you uh, can uh, um, enrich uh, the environment oh, the uh, with other... Um, you know, the, this, the, the, the literature on, on enriched environment mm -hmm. is quite substantial and quite contradictory. Even mm -hmm. the early study by Alexander were not confirmed by Alexander himself oh. and his group. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, there is, there is really, this is really a problematic area of investigation. Of course, it mu must make a difference. But I think the emphasis on enrichment can be deceiving. So, for example, in the, in the original experiment by Alexander, the animals had a shorter lifespan if they were in the rich environment because males were fighting, they were killing each other and so on. They were s fighting for resources. Okay, now the fact that they took less morphine in a rich environment actually can be consistent with my model. You take less morphine because you don't want to be sedated when there are other male rats looking for your ass. Sorry for the for this line. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. I, sh I actually have a bulk of questions, but uh, of course we Start cannot with stay one. here hours. But <laughs> uh, it was really excellent, everything. And um, came to my mind first the setting related to the psychedelic drugs that you mentioned at the end. Ah, like we tested LSD ketamine, not psychedelic drugs, but <laughs> an hallucinogenic you know, drug. Hallucinogenic, so they have really uh, small addictive properties, if, I, if I'm not, yeah, no, no, not yeah, wrong. Right. And, and the setting is very important in that case. I was thinking that as a pharmacologist, um, together with your theory, which is quite I really interesting, I would say, whether or not this could also be related to the receptors functional selectivity rather than ligand functional selectivity. I mean, when we stay alone and when we stay, uh, abroad, when we stay at home and when we stay abroad, out, out of our home, how... Oh, by the way, outside the home, it means also the, the home of a, of a friend of ours. Yes. So when we're out for a party... In another so place yeah. where we have to adapt yeah. because it's not yeah, a comfortable yeah, yeah. place, our receptors could be in a different uh, state of activation. So that's the, you know, the theory that uh, we were talking before of a protein agonist. So a drug that could behave as a partial agonist or inverse agonist. We are not, yeah. we are no, we are not uh, talking about immaterial spirit here. Yeah. Somehow this interaction must be, be you due know, to something. This is just a provocative question to say, could we measure this in the future and probably think that a drug could not behave by me. Uh, not by in me, a good or a bad way where we are? Yeah, they, they could be done, but uh, I, really, this is something that uh, deserves an investi a thorough investigation. But 
I wouldn't put my my money on this type of interpretation. Uh, also, because we have the, the, the we have animals that have been receiving drugs, uh, self missing for example, heroin repeatedly, then they go in a in a situation in which they have to choose heroin and cocaine, and they go for cocaine. So, if there is an a neuroplastic adaptation, you would think by the by the time it would have produced its effect, but it doesn't. And uh, I, th I thought you were asking what about uh, hallucinogenic drugs. So, yeah. no, 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 no. I'm not asking the question myself, right, Roger? Yeah. But with ketamine, we found the largest difference okay. in, uh, in uh, self-administration. That is, rats self-administer ketamine outside the home, but almost not at home. Oh. Almost nothing, very little. They didn't like it at home. I have a, a comment that maybe it can uh, adapt uh, some psychiatric stuff with uh, uh, drug addiction environment, let's see. And this was quite interesting. Uh, even in psychosis, absolutely the same kind of Thank you for thought, thought disorder can be completely different in the way in which be, uh, behave the patients based on the, the context. Even in those patients that with bona fide, we can say that probably there there is at least one, at least one neurotransmitter implicated, such as dopamine. I, I'm not sure that's exactly like that, but let's say that yeah. most re at least some symptoms. Exactly. And the contest can make completely different behavior, even if the diagnosis is the same. Even if the total disorder is very similar in terms of interpretation, when the subject, ch even the same person, when the person changed the context, then changed also the expression of the behavior. So th that makes a lot of sense that if something's gone on, on behavior based on uh, drug administration, that can result in a different uh, expression in terms of behavior. Now comes my question. How much you believe that I understand is a, an inference, and for which I understood you don't like too much inference, I agree with you. No, no, no I like it, but uh, okay. they should be tested. Exactly. How much you believe that another variable that is timing, or if you like, even more simple time can affect the difference in experiencing the effect of cocaine or heroin at home or outside home. You mean time in the sense of the, the time of the day? Perception of time, perception of time. Oh. Time that is passing by. Okay, ah, oh, this is, this is a, 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 my, one of my old love. The effect of drugs on time perception. I did also some experiments. Unfortunately, not with cocaine and heroin because it's very difficult to get ethical approval for that. We did it with alcohol. As you know, alcohol doesn't do anything bad to your health, so you can use it. But God forbid amphetamine or heroin. So it, um, this is interesting because I always thought, and then I'll give you just my gut feeling, that cocaine can sort of uh, speed up your perception of time, where, which is not that that difficult to, to guess, and this opposite with uh, opioids, the sort of can sort of dilate the perception of time. Now, what is the exact mechanism? Is it possible that cocaine is speeding up an internal clock? So it's making your internal time mechanism go faster. I, in, my, in my life, I did also experiment with the effects of amphetamine on the t internal timing mechanism on a stopwatch. But so if it's sped speeding it up, so what is the effect on your time perception? Actually, it makes it make it possible for you to process more information in the same space of time because your internal clock is going faster, right? And which can, uh, this can be, I mean, just a wild speculation to explain why many musicians, especially just musicians, they like to be under the effect of drugs such as cocaine and amphetamine. Uh, 
and, and their performances. And the opposite will happen with the opioid drugs that make things much, much slower. Maybe the, the effect is opposite on the internal clock. Okay. But they, they can process uh, information in, a, in opposite direction than cocaine. So very interesting. St studies should be done. I don't think it's going to be done f very quick and fast. So yeah. If you think about it, all the, the, all the experimentation on the effect of uh, psilocybin or ketamine on depression. So we are, we are talking about major psychiatric disorders who makes, that makes the life of millions, billions of people miserable. And then to get the ethic approval to test ketamine or psilocybin on this patient is a nightmare. It's completely insane. It's completely insane. So guess what is the chance that they will allow someone to test in the effect of the internal mechanism of heroin or cocaine? But if I can, uh, we have a kind of a naturalistic experiment that can be done in, uh, unfortunately, schizophrenia population. Ah. This is the opposite one. What's going on when you dry down dopamine? And unfortunately, we do with all our antipsychotics that block or better occupy D2, at least D2. And then receptor. everything becomes. Yeah, exactly. A dead, a sort of dead. Yeah. It is interesting that it's the only other patients in which we see this has nothing to do with schizophrenia patients. They are the pure Parkinsonian patients, not Parkinsonians, but pure Parkinson. They, in some way, have the same kind of problem. Yeah, the, pr the problem here is to study these people, as you know very well. Parkinson patient cannot be kept off drug for long period of time, of course, it would be unethical. And people with psychosis also cannot be taken out of drug for a long period of time. Plus, people with psychosis have cognitive problem that will interfere with, with, a, with, a, with a measuring the end point related to dopamine transmission. So I don't know what... Yeah, is there is only one way to do that. It's not easy, but can can be, can be at least tried. Okay, if you want and to talk about uh, it, we can. Before they start becoming psychotic, immediately okay. after. Yeah, the problem is the early diagnosis. Early yeah. diagnosis. Okay, that's that would be fair enough. So, I I have a quick question on a bigger issue. For who is uh, not used to work in the field of addiction. Uh, it could be quite be it could be quite surprise surprising to observe a tremendous divergence in the behaviors related to amphetamine as the professor showed at the beginning of his talk but it's not the case because it's something uh, that have been demonstrated exactly in the same lab from where he came from and it's uh, related to the cross sensitization related to the stress so somehow the experiment that professor show in terms of the different responsiveness to amphetamine basically might be related to the different environment but we can uh, translate in the different stressful environment that in the one case in the own cage actually are reduced while in the new environment actually the cortisol it's upregulated and somehow through glucocorticoid receptor cross sensitized the response. So my question here is, so that's a long story, uh, Dick, and uh, especially uh, uh, our common friend uh, uh, did for, for, for two decades, uh, uh, Pier Vincenzo Piazza, about I the rule of, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the question here is, directly the question. So is it possible, or if you know, or if you did, a very simple experiment? So in which extent, by suppressing uh, uh, glucocorticoids receptor or reducing uh, the cortisol c actually you can revert the effect on cocaine while this effect on opioid was not revertible okay so so this is uh, the, uh, uh, you mentioned Pierre V Piazza right so Pierre V Piazza and I were good friends until yeah, we published the studies so they, they didn't speak to, he didn't speak to me for a few years uh, it's a strange idea that, that if you you publish data that are opposite to your model, you sh the other person is an enemy. Of course not. Actually, I was trying to show that he was right, not trying to show. I, w I was confident I, went to, I, went to, I was going to show him right. But it didn't happen because we had neutralized rats and we provided them with, uh, with, uh, with uh, 
with the corticosterone, so to reproduce the circadian rhythm, and there was no effect on the, on the there was no um, um, change in the effect of environment on amphetamine sensitization. So many of the studies we did, uh, including the study with, uh, with dopamine, were not re repeated for all behavioral outputs. Sort of like the, when initially you find that these kind of mechanisms probably are not involved in the basic phenomenon, you cannot replicate every time. So, uh, but these experiments, this we also wonder, so just to go back to pharmacology, pharmacokinetics, is it possible that in people who outside the home environment there is a alteration of blood-brain barriers, so the amphetamine get, so we did experiments with pharmaco, measuring amphetamine in the brain areas, supposedly relevant, so the, the, the striatum, and we found no difference in between. Uh, we also excluded associative learning mechanism. Actually, it was Hans Kronbach who studied this phenomenon in great excruciating detail. Actually, Terry and Hans were convinced they were conditions, uh, the mechanism were related to associative learning, and they couldn't, and they, and they, and they we did everything. We, we use uh, condition, uh, acoustic stimuli, sounds, lights, we use uh, vibration of the chamber. So I and another student, we went to a Walmart and we bought 48 vibrators to attach the vibrators to the chambers to make them vibrate. I'm not going to tell you the face of the, the cashier when <laughs> we bought them. Because, uh, and we, so we had every, every possible stimuli, olfactory stimuli, you name it, they, we could, they could never reproduce the effects seen in the outside the home environment at home. Because one of the ideas was, oh, outside the home environment, you have more conditioned stimuli, you, you speed up associative learning. No. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.